Chapter 1. Blade Breaker. In the shadowed confines of a sanctum untouched by the passage of time, a man, known solely as 26, dwelled amidst darkness that embraced him as a second skin. His existence, fragmented and obscure, had become a cruel dance of pain and interrogation. I don't know. His life could be distilled into those three words. What little he remembered of it anyway. I don't know. He said it to the voices each time they asked him those same questions. They never asked anything else. I don't know. These words had distilled his entire being into a mantra of oblivion. What scant memories lingered of his identity were but whispers in a storm. I don't know, he echoed to the unseen voices, their queries unchanging, eternally the same. Deprived of sight, memory, and identity, 26 found himself ensnared within a cell, as much a construct of his mind as it was of cold, unyielding stone. His days, indistinguishable from one another, were punctuated by the monotony of pain and the echo of a singular question. Who are you? Blind, racked with agony and teetering on the brink of madness, 26 responded with a wild, defiant laughter. My name is whatever you wish it to be. And with those words, the illusion shattered, the torment dissipating as if it had never been. The pain that had ensnared his mind gave way to a dull ache in his limbs. Open your eyes, came the command, disembodied and firm. They are open, he protested, to no avail. Open your eyes, they insisted, disregarding his words. The mental fortifications that had confined his thoughts crumbled, a piercing light invading his darkness, heralding his awakening. After 99 days shrouded in darkness, even the faintest light was an affront to his starved senses. Before him stood three figures, two garbed in hooded robes of a hue, reminiscent of tarnished iron, the third encased in a suit of armor that gleamed like polished steel. The realization that his imprisonment was as much a psychological construct as it was physical began to dawn on him. The symbols that adorned the chamber, once obscured, now revealed themselves as wards etched into the stone, speaking of a ritual scrutiny carried out by unseen watchers. The robed figures moving with deliberate intent offered no comfort, only the stark promise of a transformation that would erase the man he had once been. Your past is inconsequential, they intoned, their voices coalescing into a singular edict of rebirth. What you will become is all that matters. As the light unveiled the architects of his fate, a revelation unfolded within him. The suffering, the blindness, the isolation, each was a meticulously orchestrated element in the process of his indoctrination. He was not merely a prisoner of tangible walls, but a pawn in a far greater scheme, a game of cosmic stakes. This was the mandated 99 days of trial, a purgation of his soul and psyche for the merest hint of chaos's taint. He was found untainted, satisfactory to their inscrutable standards. What will I become? He inquired, his voice a blend of defiance and curiosity. You will become one of us or die trying. Yet 26 was destined not to be a mere instrument of the Imperium's will. His formidable power, indomitable spirit, and insatiable curiosity set him apart from his brethren among the Grey Knights. He was to ascend as the legend known as Hyperion, the Blade Breaker, whose deeds alongside the Space Wolves and Inquisition would etch his name into the secret annals of the Imperium's most hallowed and forbidden lore. Chapter 2 Fire and Ice Imperial Date 444, M41. On the frigid world of Fenris, home to the Space Wolves, the relentless cold carved souls of unmatched resilience and savagery, it is here that Inquisitor Annika, born of this icy crucible, wields her authority with the fierce precision of Fenris's biting gales. In stark contrast lies Titan, 
sanctuary to the Imperium's most enigmatic order, the Grey Knights. This moon breathes an atmosphere steeped in ammonia and hydrogen. Its celestial canvas a perpetual display of frosty hues, a reflection of Hyperion's awakening to his fate within the ranks of these secretive guardians. Together, Hyperion and Annika, embodiments of contrasting worlds, fire forged in ice and ice tempered with fire, stand at the forefront of a shadowy conflict that threatens to unravel the very fabric of the Imperium. On this day, their paths converge against a backdrop of rebellion, as they confront one of the many insidious threats festering within the galaxy's heart. Cheth stands as a testament to the Imperium's reach, a world like countless others, yet unique in its contribution to the Emperor's war effort. An industrial nexus, it forges the sinews of war with the coin of the realm and the flesh of its people, its defenses bolstered by a million souls and 37 weapon platforms present a formidable challenge to any would-be conqueror. Yet, beneath its industrious veneer, a cancer festers. Unlike the myriad worlds under the Emperor's domain, Cheth harbors a rare sedition, its loyalty poisoned, threatening to unravel the fabric of order from within. Inquisitor Annika, a sentinel of the Emperor's will, discerns the malignant undercurrents that jeopardize not just Cheth, but the wider Imperium. Her resolve, as unyielding as Ceramite, dictates a swift excision of this burgeoning threat. The Imperial Regent, bloated with hubris and ignorance, remains blissfully unaware of the storm gathering at his doorstep. His palace, a monument to decadence, stands in stark contrast to the grim reality Annika and her companion Hyperion confront. With a declaration as cold as the void, she pronounces their doom, imprisonment and interrogation for those tainted by corruption, a death sentence for any who dare resist. In this moment, the fate of Cheth hangs in the balance, a world poised between salvation and damnation. In the regal chambers of the Imperial Palace, a grotesque revelation unfolded as the regent's form twisted into a monstrous visage, a demon hidden beneath a facade of power and decadence. The Grey Knights, ever vigilant, braced themselves as Justica Galeo summoned them to battle through their indomitable psychic bond. In an instant, a tempest of fire and ethereal might enveloped them, their arrival within the throne room, a maelstrom that shattered the sanctity of stained glass and stone. With synchronized precision, five storm bolters, extensions of their will and wrath, were aimed at the convulsing figure of the regent. His body, a mass of corruption and chaos spawn, writhed under the weight of his impending doom. Your sentence is death, they declared in unison, their voices a harbinger of the Emperor's justice. The salvo that followed was a chorus of righteous fury, obliterating the abomination that dared masquerade as the planet's steward. As the echoes of their judgment faded, only the smoldering shadow of the Regent remained a testament to the Grey Knight's efficient brutality. The blades of the Knights, now unsheathed, became conduits of their collective ire. Psychic lightning arced across the metal, imbuing it with a wrathful luminescence. The Daemon's shadow, impaled and aflame, writhed in its final throes, a shriek of annihilation, its last defiance. In the chaos, a rogue guard, his treachery laid bare, sought to strike at the heart of the Imperium's justice. But Hyperion, attuned to the faintest whispers of betrayal, foresaw the guard's desperate act. With a swift intervention, he shielded Inquisitor Annika, preserving her from the assassin's last gambit. The traitor's end was swift, Hyperion's retribution leaving nothing but a mist of blood and obliterated conviction. A warning to all who would defy the Emperor's will. In the aftermath of battle, the psychic bond that unites the Grey Knights serves as both a conduit of strength and a mirror of their individual trials. This connection, a network of minds intertwined, 
allows them to share insights and burdens with an intimacy that belies their stoic exteriors. Among them, the exchange between Hyperion and Justica Galeo stands as a testament to their brotherhood's depth, a delicate balance of consent and resistance that shapes their unity. Hyperion's interactions with Inquisitor Annika illuminate the complexities of his existence as a Grey Knight, the labyrinth of human emotions so alien to his engineered nature presents a challenge that dwarfs even the horrors of combat. His prowess on the battlefield, while securing the trust and admiration of the Inquisitor, does little to bridge the gulf of understanding between them. Her references to hunters and packs, terms steeped in the traditions of her world, resonate with a significance that eludes him, highlighting the isolation wrought by his indoctrination. Yet, it is her prophecy that casts the longest shadow, a foretelling of a dark prince's return that tugs at the fabric of destiny. Her insistence on the Grey Knight's vigilance, a call to arms against a threat shrouded in superstition and law, marks a divergence from protocol that Hyperion, young in the ways of the Order, finds himself ill-equipped to answer. The Grey Knights were destined elsewhere, and yet Annika requests they stay with her, a trusted blade to wield in the dark times to come. Despite the protocol and the vast chasm of experience that separates them, Inquisitor Annika's plea does not fall on deaf ears. Her faith in Hyperion and his brethren, her conviction in the face of impending darkness, plants the seeds of a daunting quest. As the Grey Knights mend the rifts in their psychic union and ponder the Inquisitor's warnings, they stand at the precipice of a saga that will test their mettle, their loyalty, and their understanding of the galaxy they have sworn to protect. Hyperion, a warrior shaped by the crucible of war and the mysteries of the psyche, finds himself at the heart of a prophecy that could alter the course of history. However, to truly convince the Castian Brotherhood of the Grey Knights to follow her into the mouth of the Abyss, she would need to make her case to Hyperion's Justicar. Chapter 3 The Taint of Chaos The Carabella was Squad Castian's chariot through the stars, a vessel built for speed and now a silent witness to the weight of the decisions that rest upon their shoulders. Their destination unknown to all but a few, the urgency of their mission whispers through the void, and Justica Galeo was convinced by the cryptic words of the Inquisitor. A revelation shatters the silence of their journey. The Frostborn, a Space Wolves hunter-class destroyer, adrift and lifeless in the vast emptiness of space. Galeo's psychic call to arms resonates with a grim familiarity among his brothers. The Frostborn's fate, marred by malformation and scarring, speaks of horrors beyond the ken of void warfare. Etheric scars mar its hull, a testament to its perilous journey through the warp without safeguard. A reckless dash through the Immaterium that spelled its doom. The truth of the Frostborn's end, hinted at by ruptures from within, paints a tale of betrayal or madness of something sinister that sought freedom from its metallic womb. The destroyer's silent hulk, now a crypt floating in the black sea of space, holds the key to mysteries untold, its secrets locked within the cold embrace of the void. Within the desolate silence of the void, the Grey Knights harbor a unique communion, a psychic bond that allows them to share visions and insights. For Hyperion, this ability was not just a tool, but an extension of his very being, seamlessly linking his consciousness with Inquisitor Annika as they delved into the mysteries of the derelict vessel. The tendrils of his perception wove through the ship's carcass, each revelation of its interior, a testament to his growing power, a fact not lost on Galeo, who observed Hyperion's burgeoning strength with a mix of pride and caution. The Astartes warship was a repository of ancient knowledge, its architecture a blend of technological prowess and aesthetic grandeur that predated even the Imperium's darkest ages. 
the juxtaposition of functionality and splendor spoke of its dual purpose. A bastion against the void's horrors and a monument to the warrior monks who called it home. Yet, within its hallowed halls, a macabre scene unfolded, bodies torn asunder, adrift in the weightlessness of space, their frozen blood painting a tableau of unspeakable violence. Hyperion, guided by Galeo's command, approached one of the fallen, a silent sentinel to the carnage that had claimed the Frostborn. The evidence before them spoke of a massacre, the culprits none other than the children of Sanguinius, their corruption a blight upon their once honorable name. Amid this revelation, Hyperion's role as a pyrokinetic, capable of wielding fire, as a weapon of purification, became all the more pivotal. His potential for ascending, a transcendence beyond the physical realm into the storm of psychic energy, was likened to explaining the concept of a thunderstorm to a child of the Underhive who had never witnessed the sky's fury. The Grey Knight's mission within the Frostborn was more than a search. It was a pilgrimage into the heart of darkness, a test of their resolve and unity in the face of an ancient evil that had left its mark on the vessel. As Hyperion stood on the precipice of ascending, he embodied the Order's relentless pursuit of purity, a beacon of light against the shadow that had enveloped the Frostborn. Hyperion's journey through the Frostborn became a voyage into the heart of its desolation. As he extended his senses beyond the physical, the ship revealed itself to him in all its tragic aspects. He navigated its corridors, not with eyes but with a psychic perception that illuminated the darkness, a beacon in the void. The palpable sense of corruption permeated every bulkhead, a malignancy that had seeped into the very marrow of the vessel. Yet, it was the silence of the dead, their final moments whispered into the vacuum, that haunted him most, a testament to the ship's grim fate. The source of this pervasive blight soon became clear. The navigator, once the guiding light through the warp, had succumbed to corruption, dooming the Frostborn to a journey without end or mercy. The realization was stark. The ship and its machine spirit were beyond redemption. A solemn decree was passed. The Frostborn was to be scuttled, its remnants cast into the void, a funeral pyre for its lost souls. Yet as the Grey Knights readied themselves for this last rite, a spark of life, faint and fragile, stirred among the desolation. Hyperion, his ascension complete, became the conduit for this discovery. Imbued with the depth of his psychic might that directed them to the source, a survivor amidst the ruin, untainted by the corruption that had claimed so many. The discovery of the wolves, entombed yet untouched by the darkness, marked a moment of revelation. Amidst the pervasive decay, they found one who had resisted the warp's stain, a beacon of resilience in the shadow of despair. Chapter 4 Erased from Record Access to Written Transcript Denied Chapter 5 Death is Coming His form a testament to the brutality of their unseen adversary. Draped in the blood-soaked purity of a white cloak, his legs reduced to stumps, frozen blood anchoring him to the deck, he was a grim effigy of survival against all odds. Yet within this broken shell, a spark endured. Devoid of the corruption that they had braced themselves to find, the Space Wolf lay in a state beyond mere sleep, sustained by the thinnest thread of psychic energy. It was a hibernation born of necessity, his life preserved by the merest whisper of vitality. This discovery, a warrior untouched by taint, yet ensnared in the grip of death, presented the Grey Knights with a mystery as profound as the darkness that sought to consume them. Galeo's warning, a command edged with the knowledge of battles fought and yet to come, hung heavy in the silence that followed. Roused from his stasis by the presence of the Grey Knights, the Space Wolf's resurgence was marked by a feral intensity. His voice, ragged and harsh, bore the weight of centuries and battles unnumbered. To him, 
the Grey Knight's warded armor was an enigma, a specter from tales whispered in the long halls of Fenris. Such revelations, shared openly amongst warriors, breached traditions held sacred, yet necessity dictated this breach. Grimnar, the venerable Great Wolf, had once spoken of these phantom knights, weaving stories Hyperion and his brothers believed woven from myth and shadow. Yet here, in the cold reality of the Frostborn's demise, myth merged with flesh and blood. The Space Wolf, his existence a testament to the unyielding spirit of his kind, spoke with a candor as raw as the wounds that marred his body. Vulgar and visceral, his words painted a tapestry of chaos unleashed, of worlds consumed by fire and ash, of relentless pursuits across the stars, and of battles fought against a darkness that sought to extinguish their very souls. He spoke of the Neverborn, entities birthed from the darkest corners of the warp, their singular purpose to silence the howls of the space wolves. Armageddon, the industrial heart of the Imperium, choked beneath a shroud of pollution and flame, had become the stage for this apocalyptic dance. It was there, amidst the ashes of civilization, that the Great Wolf had called upon the Grey Knights, bidding them purge the grotesque tide that threatened to overrun the galaxy. Hyperion, his mind a conduit for the Space Wolf's fading essence, beheld visions of Armageddon's plight with a clarity that bordered on prescience. The decision was forged in the crucible of their shared resolve, to make war upon Armageddon, to confront the Devourer of Stars, as the Space Wolf's vitality waned, his revelation shed light on the tragedy that befell the Frostborn. The Navigator, once the vessel's guiding star, had become its undoing, his corruption a beacon that drew them into the maw of despair. In this moment of communion, the Grey Knights recognized the weight of their charge. Armageddon beckoned, a world on the brink of annihilation, calling forth its defenders from the shadows of legend to stand against a tide of unrelenting darkness. Within the clandestine ranks of the Grey Knights, the dichotomy of duty and autonomy entwines like a double-edged sword. As the militant arm of the Ordo Malaeus, their existence is to enact the will of the Inquisition, a directive that brooks no dissent. Yet, within the sanctum of their brotherhood, debate and discord simmer, a reflection of the complexity that underpins their sacred charge. The recent edict from the Inquisitor, a command that strained against their instincts, sowed seeds of unrest. The decision not to scuttle the Frostborn immediately, driven by motivations marred by the frailties of emotion, was anathema to their purpose. It was a discordance that threatened to blossom into outright rebellion. Obedience, however begrudging, guided their steps as they continued their search through the Frostborn, reduced to mere extensions of the Inquisitor's will. As they approached the Navigator's Sanctum, a malignant presence cloaked in deception gnawed at Hyperion's senses. Galeo, with a mastery born of countless campaigns, quelled the burgeoning storm of rage within their ranks, shepherding his brothers with a calm that belied the tempest within. The Sanctum of the Navigator, a paradox of grandeur amidst the desolation unfurled before them. Crafted to echo the opulence of a bygone era, it was a gilded cage that masked the rot within. Adornments of exquisite craftsmanship juxtaposed against the utilitarian brutality of ancient tech, a mockery of sanctity in a realm where corruption had taken root. As the Navigator's third eye, a maelstrom of psychic malevolence unveiled itself. The Grey Knights averted their gaze, knowing well the peril that lay in its depths. No armor, no creed, could shield them from the abyss that stared back from that bloody orb. In a moment fraught with destiny, Galeo issued the command for judgment, his voice a clarion call to action amidst the encroaching darkness. Channeling the collective might of his brethren, Galeo advanced a figure of righteous vengeance. Energy coursed through him, a conduit of their unified will, as he sought to deliver the final blow. But in the stillness that followed, the blade hung suspended, 
caught in the grasp of the Navigator, a testament to the unfathomable power that defied them. Chapter 6. A Race Against Time The Sanctum's air grew thick with malice as the Grey Knights found themselves ensnared in a meticulously woven trap. From the shadows crept demons, the Neverborn, their forms a grotesque testament to the Warp's perverse creativity. These vampiric entities, drawn to the purity of the Grey Knight's armor like moths to a flame, initiated a dance of death that closed the distance between hunter and hunted. The room became a crucible of chaos, with swollen yellow eyes gleaming with malevolent glee. The Grey Knights, undeterred by the laws of physics defied by their foes, engaged in brutal close-quarters combat. Around 50 of these amalgamations of limbs and malice converged, their visages so hideously unique, they defied comprehension. Amidst the cacophony of battle, the demons spat venomous words, weaving a tapestry of doubt and insecurity, seeking to fracture the indomitable will of the knights. An ominous power seemed to bolster the Neverborn, their strength waxing as the conflict dragged on. Blades sang through the air, severing demon flesh with righteous fury, while gouts of sanctified fire purged unholy essence from existence. The Grey Knights fought with a desperation born of necessity, their resolve unyielding in the face of this abyssal onslaught. Venturing into the warp, unprotected was akin to diving into the depths of madness itself. Within its tumultuous embrace, reality twisted and buckled, senses betrayed by the fluidity of its realm. Yet, the Grey Knights stood as beacons of incorruptibility, shielded not just by the Emperor's genetic legacy, but by a dedication that transcended mere flesh. This dedication, a fusion of sacrifice and unwavering purpose, imbued the Grey Knights with a curiosity, a trait as rare as it was dangerous. For Hyperion, this curiosity beckoned like a siren's call, hinting at a destiny beyond the confines of his oath to the Inquisition, a destiny where his allegiance, forged in the crucible of unyielding faith and sacrifice, might one day challenge the very chains that bound him to his duty. In the climactic confrontation within the Navigator's Sanctum, Hyperion became the instrument of retribution, channeling his fury into a decisive blow. With a swift, unrelenting strike, he obliterated the Navigator's third eye, the source of its malevolent vision. The blade, an extension of his wrath, cleaved through the air, bursting the Navigator's skull and silencing its psychic poison forever. However, Hyperion's actions, while heroic, teetered on the brink of recklessness. His anger, a tempest unchecked, threatened to unmake the unity that defined the Grey Knights. As he locked gazes with the Navigator, a seething well of hatred in his eyes, Galeo intervened. The Justicar, ever the anchor in the storm, sought to recalibrate the energies of his squad, reminding them of the strength found in unity, not in solitary fervor. Hyperion, in the aftermath of his impulsive strike, found himself adrift in a sea of rebuke. The demon lurking within the Navigator, nearly freed by his unbridled assault, was a stark reminder of the razor's edge they walked. Galeo's admonition served as a cold splash of reality, tempering Hyperion's fiery spirit. The Justicar's warning was clear. A second lapse in judgment would not be tolerated. Hyperion was a force of nature, a wild stallion whose power was undeniable. The tension that followed Hyperion's snapback, a ripple of discontent among his brothers, underscored the delicate balance between discipline and individuality. His disrespect, a fissure in the otherwise unbreakable facade of the Grey Knights, spoke to a deeper struggle, a battle not just against the external foes, but within the very souls of these warriors. Amidst the maelstrom of demon spawn, Hyperion found himself at a disadvantage, his mastery not in the art of the sword, but in the arcana of psychic combat. His stave, an extension of his will, carved arcs of defiance through the air, 
warding off the relentless assault of tendrils and the press of grotesque forms seeking to overwhelm him and his brothers. Each swing, a symphony of force repelled the encroaching darkness, yet it was his inadvertent brush with the minds of the demons that spelled near disaster. In that fleeting contact, a mire of hatred and malice sought to ensnare him, a psychic backlash that dulled his senses and slowed his reactions. The enemy's anger, a virulent echo of their malevolent essence, began to seep into his consciousness. It was Galeo, his Justicar, whose stern admonition cut through the fog of war, refocusing Hyperion's scattered senses. Together, their blades became beacons of purifying flame, the silver of their weapons igniting the very air, scattering black ichor across the deck as daemons fell before them. Galeo, with the seasoned grace of countless battles, marshaled the collective might of the squad. His stewardship of their combined energies was a testament to the trust bestowed upon him, each maneuver executed with a precision that brooked no argument, a deadly ballet of psychic and physical prowess. Yet, the battle was as much within. The Grey Knights faced not only the physical onslaught of chaos, but a perilous drift into the tempest of memories and consciousness, a weapon of the warp designed to disorient and divide. This psychic disarray, a labyrinth of past anguishes and fears, threatened to sever their focus from the immediate threat, showcasing the insidious nature of chaos and the imperative of maintaining an unwavering mind. In this crucible, the brothers learned the true meaning of vigilance. The fight against the demon horde was not merely a test of strength, but a battle for the sanctity of their souls, a reminder of the dangers that lurk in the unchecked depths of psychic energy. In the aftermath of the chaotic fray, Hyperion, driven by a tempest of purpose and recklessness, transcended the confines of his physical form. His consciousness, a spectral force, plunged through the bowels of the ship, drawn inexorably towards the demon that had eluded destruction. A wisp of malevolence fleeing from the carnage it had wrought, this pursuit, born from Hyperion's impulsive defiance, stretched the limits of his psychic prowess, propelling him too far, too swiftly into the labyrinthine core of the Frostborn. Galeo's admonitions, stern and imbued with the weight of command, echoed through the psychic void, a clarion call for Hyperion to abandon his reckless quest. Yet, the allure of the hunt ensnared him, a siren song, that fueled his rebellion against caution and order. Hyperion's quarry, a psychic spore of corruption, nestled within the drive core's plasma ooze, became the focus of his singular obsession. With a resolve bordering on hubris, Hyperion endeavored to vanquish the spirit that was attempting to resurrect the Frostborn's slumbering systems, a gambit fraught with peril. The generators, their lifeblood a viscous stream of oil, trembled with a premonition of doom. In his fervor, Hyperion inadvertently ensnared a brother in this psychic maelstrom, a precipitous act that threatened to rend soul from flesh, leaving his fellow knight adrift in the abyss of non-being. The demonic entity, a parasitic blight seeking union with the ship's machine spirit, harbored apocalyptic intentions. Its aim was to transform the drive core into a cataclysmic beacon, a signal fire to the denizens beyond the veil heralding a new dawn of chaos and destruction. Before we reach the climax to this tale, consider checking out our Grey Knight merchandise linked below. Patreon members get access to exclusive digital artwork and graphic novel lore guides. YouTube members get ad-free content and select digital posters. Chapter 7. Hyperion's Costly Gambit In the quietude of the void, a stark communion unfolded between Hyperion and the Inquisitor, their minds entwined by necessity. Hyperion, with a gravity born of impending doom, silenced the Inquisitor's inquiries, imparting the grim reality of their situation. The demon's malevolent scheme that threatened to unravel the very fabric of reality. His command was terse, an imperative laced with urgency. Do it now, human! The Inquisitor's response, die well, 
a farewell steeped in grim acceptance, marked the Carabella's retreat towards Titan, carrying the weight of a warning that might never reach its intended recipients if the Grey Knights faltered. The Frostborn, its warp chamber exposed to the cold embrace of the Void, enacted its final cataclysmic act of defiance. Vital systems were purged into the darkness, its structural integrity sacrificed to tear a rent in reality, a portal through which chaos bled into the material realm. From this maw of destruction, a horde of winged demons surged, their forms a nightmare made flesh, empowered by their virgin taste of reality. Yet these creatures, for all their ferocity, were but the vanguard of a more profound terror. Amidst their number, a being of mythic stature emerged, its presence a blight upon its lesser kin, which it slew with indiscriminate fury. Faith is our shield, Hyperion proclaimed, a rallying cry that fortified the resolve of the Grey Knights. Against the relentless tide, their unity formed an aegis, an aura of sanctity that repelled the demon horde. With blades that sang songs of purity and fire, that cleansed with holy wrath, they carved a path through the onslaught. The Aegis, their sacred defense, became the anvil upon which the demons broke. Yet, even as they turned the tide, Galeo's admonition reached Hyperion, a warning against the reckless expenditure of his powers. The Justicar's voice, a beacon of wisdom amidst the storm, cautioned Hyperion as he contended with a demon of seven faces, a creature that sought to ensnare him with whispers of recognition. Together, the Grey Knights stood as bulwarks against the dark, their blades relentless, their faith unyielding. The tide of corruption was stemmed, the immediate threat quelled. But at what cost? Hyperion's defiance, a double-edged sword, hinted at rifts that ran deeper than the void itself. In the theater of war, Hyperion's martial skills may not have mirrored the exemplary prowess of his brothers, yet in the discipline of marksmanship, he found his calling. With the precision of a sniper, he dispatched his foes, his wrist-mounted bolter a harbinger of death for the Diamond Horde. Each projectile, a promise of obliteration, found its mark, transforming the enemies of man into pyrotechnic spectacles that banished them back to the Immaterium. A cathedral gargoyle, its wings dyed in the blood of countless battles, became the next testament to Hyperion's deadly aim. As the demon surged towards him, a crimson mist heralded its demise, the bolt around detonating mere inches from Hyperion. Its essence dispersed in an explosion that painted his armor in the hues of conquest. In the heart of conflict, the Justicar, a beacon of their collective will, struck the initial blow against the demon sire. His voice, a conduit of psychic might, became a weapon of pure harmony that ruptured the very essence of the beast, its eye bursting under the force of the attack. The ensuing chaos, a maelstrom of wrath and anger, fueled the Grey Knights, transforming their righteous indignation into a storm that ravaged the demon horde. Confronted by a greater demon, a manifestation of war's eternal hunger, the brothers faced a foe that demanded engagement on dual fronts. The psychic and spiritual battlegrounds merged with the physical, embodying the horrors of war, a composite of nightmares, pain, and the palpable fear of soldiers overwhelmed by the inexorable tide of battle. In this crucible, Hyperion's revelation pierced the fog of war. Recognition dawned within him. The creature's name whispered across the annals of ancient lore and sagas long studied. This was no ordinary foe, but an ancient terror. Its body a tapestry of steel from countless failed attempts to vanquish it, a behemoth tenfold his stature. The assault was relentless, the Grey Knights descending upon the creature with a fury born of eons of warfare. Their blades tore at its wings, the leathery hide of its monstrous form, even as Hyperion aimed a concentrated psychic strike at the exposed grey matter of its skull. His battle cry, an echo of fear incarnate, sought to unmake the demon from within. Yet the effort faltered, 
The demon's retaliation swift and devastating. Hyperion was cast into the void, his armor compromised, oxygen venting into the cold embrace of space, his very life hanging in the balance as his systems faltered. Galeo's curse, a rebuke of Hyperion's recklessness, reverberated through the void. It was a moment of reckoning, a testament to the peril of underestimating the enemy and the cost of hubris. Hyperion, adrift and broken, confronted the reality of his actions. A warrior caught in the precipice between life and death, his fate uncertain. Covered in the ichor of their enemy, from their boots to their helms, they stood as a testament to resilience and wrath. Yet, in the wake of victory, the air was heavy with an unspoken lament. Words were superfluous when the bond of brotherhood had suffered such a profound loss. But the loss was not Hyperion. Sophis, the twin of Malkadil, had sacrificed himself in order to save Hyperion. A daring rescue mission ended in the salvation of Hyperion and the death of Sophis to the void of space. Hyperion, adrift in space, was too far gone to be saved without sacrifice. A sacrifice Sophis had made. In the aftermath of battle, the unity that binds the Grey Knights was tested as never before. Their minds, a network of shared consciousness, felt the wrenching void left by Sophis's silence. The abrupt cessation of his psychic presence sent ripples of grief and disquiet through their ranks, each brother mourning the loss, not just of a comrade, but of a part of their collective soul. Sophis's final moments, tinged with vulnerability and shame, were a burden they all bore, a stark reminder of the cost of their eternal war. The specter of retribution took form. Sophis's twin confronted Hyperion. During the heat of battle, Hyperion charged forward with the false confidence that he had known the demon's true name, and therefore, the ability for his brothers to banish it. A grievous error that cost them dearly. This admission, a raw exposure of Hyperion's guilt, threatened to fracture the unity that was their strength. It was Galeo's voice, imbued with a touch of manipulation, that soothed the tempest of emotions threatening to overwhelm them. His guidance, a beacon of calm amidst the turmoil, shepherded the brothers back to the Carabella. Their return was not just a physical journey, but a pilgrimage of reflection and reconciliation, as they grappled with the consequences of their actions and the immutable bond that defined their existence. As the Carabella unleashed its fury upon the remnants of the Frostborn, consigning it to oblivion piece by piece, Hyperion found himself ensnared in a crucible of judgment, severed from the psychic communion that bound him to his brothers. He stood accused before them, the weight of his actions, a specter that loomed large in the cold expanse of space. Galeo, the embodiment of their collective will and discipline, voiced the indictment with a solemnity that brooked no dissent. You have failed, he declared, his words echoing the gravity of their conclave. Hyperion's bravado, his defiance of command, and his solitary path had frayed the edges of their unity, bringing him to the precipice of censure. For all his might, Hyperion's insularity threatened the very foundation of their brotherhood. His power, undeniable yet unruly, disrupted the harmonic convergence of their psychic might, compelling his brothers to forsake their formations in his defense. This final admonition laid bare before him. Lone wolves die alone, hunters work in a pack. No further transgressions would be tolerated. The path of redemption was narrow and fraught with peril. In a moment of profound vulnerability, the minds of the Grey Knights coalesced around Hyperion once more, enveloping him in a maelstrom of grief and penitence. The psychic touch of Malkadil, a conduit of shared sorrow, and the raw ache of loss offered a glimmer of reconciliation. It was a communion of pain, a tentative step towards absolution, yet the chasm of trust eroded by Hyperion's actions remained vast, a division that yawned wide and deep. 
As the Carabella set its course away from the remnants of the Frostborn, Hyperion stood at the crossroads of his destiny. The path to forgiveness was shadowed by the specter of his transgressions, a testament to the arduous journey towards redemption. In the silent vigil of space, the final chapter of Hyperion's saga whispered of the challenges that lay ahead, of battles yet to be fought and the promise of unity yet to be restored. As Hyperion and his brethren charted their course back to Titan, the only home he had ever known, a rare moment of introspection unfolded within the confines of his battle-hardened psyche. Despite the engineered perfection that set him apart from humanity, he found himself captivated by the celestial dance of the galaxy. The sight of the sun's corona, a crown of light in the void, stirred something within him. His twin hearts, engines of war and faith, quickened at the majesty unfurled before him, prompting a heretical whisper of doubt. Should humanity have ever ventured into the stars? This question, laced with the enormity of their crusade across the galaxy, brushed against the core of his being, a query he knew contradicted the Imperium's manifest destiny. Yet such blasphemous musings were abruptly cast aside as a space wolf vessel tore through the veil of reality. The vessel's chaotic plunge from the warp into the heart of the Grey Knight's sanctuary signaled a dire threat that would spell doom for them all. To be continued.